Well, look, I'll ask you this question. Of how many politicians can it be said that when you listen to them, you learn something and you feel that as a community, we're better off for them being there? That's true of Mark Latham. He is head and shoulders above any other talent in the New South Wales Parliament and may well be the most outstanding political figure today in this country. He is in the vanguard of what I talked about yesterday and today, re-Governor Ron DeSantis in Florida, taking indoctrination and ideology out of education and getting on with the job of proper teaching. I'll come to that in a moment but with Mark, but firstly, one or two questions without notice, although actually all my questions to Mark Latham were without notice. We never have a discussion about what we're going to talk about. He can handle anything you throw at him. Of course, Mark is the leader of the One Nation Party in New South Wales. Mark, glad to have you again. But before we get to this crisis in education, what has happened to Dominic Perrottet? Wherever you turn, he's got no hesitation in throwing his own people under a bus I praised him to the rooftops when he got the gig because he seemed a genuine liberal. He spoke genuine liberal language. He seemed unafraid to speak his mind. Now he's throwing away government, becoming one of the wets that voters have rejected right across the country. What's happened? Well, he's got two problems. One is he got the leadership and became uh, Premier of New South Wales using the Liberal Party numbers supplied by Matt Keane, who's not really a liberal. He's not certainly not a conservative. He's on the green left of politics and Keane has followers in there. They walk around that Parliament House like zombies, Alan, following Keane. Uh, they haven't got a brain cell between them, but uh, they've got all those woke green left liberals uh, in the New South Wales Parliament. Keane's got the numbers and Perrottet is uh, dancing to that particular tune, uh, which is a great shame, really. He's a much uh, more capable person than being a, a Matt Keane um, functionary. And uh, his second problem is that uh, ever since he got the job, so what's that, about 10 months now, he's just done crisis management. Uh, it was COVID and then uh, floods and now this Barillaro business. You've got to strike out a direction. New South Wales has big challenges, big problems in its schools, uh, in its health system, in its transport system, uh, in the way the public service functions, in customer service. You know, these are huge challenges. And Perrottet needs to set out to the people of the state what is his agenda for solving these enormous problems and giving them some value in the next term of Absolutely. parliament if see, they were to be re-elected? See, he used to mock the idea of having the Indigenous flag enjoying equivalence with the Australian flag and the New South Wales flag. Now he says it'll be a permanent feature at a cost of $25 million. I mean, can he go down to Bunnings and find out how much a flagpole and a flag might cost and how much a good tradesman will charge to climb the bridge and stick it up there, not $25 million. Now, admittedly, he's acknowledged that now, but how do he allow the politically damaging figure of $25 million to see the light of day? Well, this is the uh, the curse of virtue signalling. If all you've got to answer the serious problems of Indigenous people in New South Wales is a flag on a bridge, well, you become a laughing stock. Alan, I used the winter recess of the Parliament um, three weeks ago to get out to Walgett, Moree, Burke, Bawarana, and the problems you find in Indigenous communities, kids not going to school, uh, kids being sexually assaulted, um, welfare dependency, uh, capable, young, strapping Indigenous guys who won't put their name down for a job. In Burke, they just opened a, a new abattoir, 75 jobs, and they can only fill 15. None of the Indigenous will put their name down for the remaining 60, and those 60 are most likely to be imported workers from East Timor. So we, we've got huge problems there in Indigenous community. Housing standards are, are lousy, and if, if you're all you're engaged in is a, a meaningless flag on a bridge, well, you're not really um, a serious politician no, with serious public policy. Not at all. I mean, then you've got the state's renewable energy target. He said 50% by 2030, he says, will help future-proof New South Wales power supply. I mean, has Dominic Perrottet gone nuts? I mean, he talked about a lost decade, meaning that there's been a lack of private sector investment in renewables. But since 2012, more than 90% of investment in electricity generation in the eastern states has been in wind and solar. In per capita terms, we've got the highest rate of renewable grid scale generation in the world. Not that it'll be able to keep the lights on and business going. But I mean, where does he get this stuff from? Keen. Well, he gets it from Matt Green. And, and, and this is the problem. Green promised uh, a reduction in electricity prices of $130 for households, $430 for businesses. How's that going? I mean, the prices have gone exactly the opposite direction and documents obtained 
um, under my motion in the upper house show that New South Wales is slated to have uh, blackouts in 2025 and 26 after the closure of Araring and Liddell Power Station. So uh, there's no answer um, through renewables. No. Uh, you need reliable base load power. Yeah. You can do that essentially through gas, coal or nuclear. You can't do it through renewables, 100%. wind and solar 100%. power. But so then... if Perrottet doesn't understand that, he's sending New South Wales down the pathway of higher electricity prices and the disaster of blackouts. 100% correct, Mark. You, we've talked about it before here, but I mean, Perrottet then chose Matt Keane as his deputy, who is the Energy Minister and the Treasurer of New South Wales. And then it's worth repeating, you and I discussed it on this program, New South Wales takes out the wooden spoon, the worst fiscal performer in Australia. Now, Queensland and Victoria are profligate and irresponsible, but New South Wales would make you weep. 2021, Net government debt, that's last year. Net government debt, 37 billion. This financial year, 78 billion. An increase of 110% in two years. But Dominic Perrottet boasts about this wonderful budget, Mark. No, 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 no. This is the problem that Morrison and Frydenberg had. People don't recognise today's Liberal Party because they've given up on fiscal discipline. It's yep. just an absolute spendathon and racking up debt for future generations to pay. That, that shouldn't be the Liberal Party way. Uh, but again, with Keane as Treasurer, uh, they're headed, Alan, uh, those debt figures are much worse. They're headed to a gross debt in New South Wales of $182 billion. And the interest on that to service uh, the debt with interest payments, we'll be spending more on interest payments in New South Wales than we spend on the police force statewide and also running TAFE. So these are huge numbers of debt and interest payments that... Um, indicate that um, uh, the, the government's lost all fiscal discipline. They've had about 330 policy changes in their last two budgets. Only three of them were cost savings. Everything else is just spend, 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 debt, debt, debt. And the deficits, of course, are enormous. Extraordinary. There we are. That's the profile of New South Wales completely outspending the Labor states. Education, Mark, are we making any progress on what is taught in the classroom. Now, we've heard all sorts of plans about paying teachers more, rewarding the so-called good teachers, though how you determine a good teacher, I'm not sure, hiring people to do non-teaching tasks, such as playground supervision. But who is addressing the issue of what the kids are being taught? Well, I'm trying to. Uh, just yesterday at our budget estimates, I raised the shocking oversight um, I, I received from um, information sources, uh, uh, an email sent by the Education Department, there was someone complaining about political content in the classroom and the response from the department was, we don't have a policy for the use of political propaganda in classrooms. Now, what does that mean? You can run uh, party political material in classrooms at election time, you can run Nazi material, you can run Black Lives Matter, you can put up posters that they did at one school, uh, um, uh, vilifying the New South Wales police, saying pigs out of the country. Uh, well, what's going on here, Alan? Sarah Mitchell, the minister, at the end of 2019, said something I thought was a, a breakthrough. She said she wanted politics out of the classrooms of New South Wales. But we find out three years later, they haven't got a policy of uh, eliminating political propaganda. There's no restriction on what the teachers can do in terms of the politics in the classroom. So it becomes political indoctrination instead of education. Absolutely. I mean, I, I mentioned yesterday the Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and his recent address to a school in one of his counties, and he said what you and I have been saying for years, and I quote him, our mantra has been in our schools to educate kids, not indoctrinate kids, hopefully. What we are doing is saying that teaching is not about learning education in college or university. It's about having proficiency in subjects, then learning on the ground how to teach them, unquote. Now, Mark, for all the money in the world, $140 billion we spend in this country on education. We don't teach proficiency in English, maths and science. I mean, kids can't recite a verse of poetry. They don't know their own language. They don't know their geography or their history. And now they're told to learn from their laptop. I mean, the face-to-face, -face, rigorous, personal instruction that you've advocated, where knowledge is hammered into people. That's all over, apparently, is it? Well, um, unfortunately, they're not uh, being taught pride in Australia either. Uh, just last week, uh, I raised an example of a, a school in the central west of New South Wales where for year one students, so these are six-year-old Alans, they were being taught that Australian history was genocide. 
that we're a genocidal nation and, and this is a colouring in exercise mm. for a NADOC poster. Yes, yes. And this denigration of Australia are saying that we're still ch stealing Indigenous children, which is not true that we're still stealing Indigenous wages, yes. which is not true. This is a political propaganda. And we're living in, we've stolen which this I country. Find to be sick. We've stolen this well, country. These kids sick. genuinely believe that. Well, it's a sickness when uh, grown adults, teachers, are trying to push their political views upon six-year-olds who wouldn't understand what genocide is. We're trying to teach these kids how to read and write and do numbers, not adult concepts like uh, uh, genocide and going into the detail of Australian history uh, in, in a year one class, but, you know, we need someone like Ron DeSantis. Uh, yeah. uh, what a what an inspiration. He, he said something, I wish it was true in New South Wales, Alan. He said he wants Florida to be a place where woke goes to die. That's it. How we, good is that? Could we yeah. get a leader here yeah. to say that New South Wales is that. a place where woke I, goes I, to die? I, I used that last you know, what night. Will, what will yeah, I, I used that night where woke goes to die. Just before you go, though, the, the trouble is that government and education ministers are in a complete state of denial. They want to tell you everything is terrific when international metrics prove we are miles behind comparable overseas countries wasting taxpayers' money. So I'll ask you one final question here, which bothers me. Do parents care? This is all going on, on yeah, yeah, yeah. under their eyes. Yeah. Yeah, so, well, a lot of parents care. I get a steady flow through my office of parents saying, I don't want political propaganda. In, in the school. Uh, these are conservative people of religious faith, people of common sense yeah. who want education. They want literacy, numeracy. Yeah. They want the basic skills of education. They don't want political indoctrination. And and they know, Alan, their children are paying a price. Uh, we all complain about China, but what about our self-inflicted wounds that the international testing shows that 15-year-old students in New South Wales are four years behind China in maths, three and a half years behind in science. We are throwing away Australia's advantages in being a skilled, relatively intelligent nation through the failings of our education system. And we're going to pay this price for decades to come. Brilliant. You're absolutely brilliant. You're the hope of the side. Keep at it, my friend. We'll keep giving you a forum and we will get there. We have to. This battle for the intellectual... Well, Alan, Alan one, one good thing about your show, this is a place where woke comes to die. We've found one spot. That's your show. So <laughs> That's good right. on you. Thank you. And I've got to commend you because our viewers are saying, have a look at him. Doesn't he look good? And yes, he does. He's taken some advice about his health and well-being, and he's lost some weight and he looks sensational. So there you are, Mark. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks, Alan. There is Mark Latham. This battle, as I was saying then, for the intellectual well-being of our children has to be won. Mark Latham is the very man to take up the fight.